Good morning and welcome to St Luke's Sunday Service Online. Whether you are regular, partaker, occasional or first time, we welcome to our service this morning. We are living in the light of Easter Day and the resurrection of Christ. So I say to you, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. So glad you can join us online today. Uh, and I pray that this service will speak to your heart at this difficult time for us all. Do please keep in touch with us. Uh, we have a website which is at www.st-lukes.co.uk. Uh, our email address is also on there. If you'd like us to keep in touch with you by email, do let us know. After this morning's service, there will be a Zoom gathering to chat together. Uh, an email link will be sent to you uh, if you're on church email. Join us for our Zoom gathering afterwards. Uh, for our young people, do enjoy our service. You will also have had an email with a web link uh, with some activities that you can do any time later today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, church family birthdays coming up. Uh, tomorrow is uh, Barbara Beaumont's birthday. Uh, congratulations, many happy returns of the day. And uh, on Tuesday, it's the birthday of Helen Cullen. Uh, congratulations, Helen. I won't say uh, what your age is. I know it's a special day for you as uh, your age now ends in a zero. Congratulations all the same. All you need for our service this morning is on the screen. If the words are in blue, please join in. If they are in any other colour, then simply listen and enjoy. This morning also, we are remembering Jesus' death and resurrection in communion. So I hope that you will have to hand some bread and a glass of wine and we will be using uh, an order of service later on, a Holy Communion service with the bread and wine to celebrate. So to a moment of prayer. Lord Jesus, we are here to meet with you, to worship you, to know you're present with us in these anxious times. Draw us close to you. May our worship delight you. May your word feed us, deepening our faith and filling us with hope. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Behold, the light has come, the darkness scatters before him. Lord Jesus, you live again. Death could not hold you. Lord Jesus, you conquer death. Our hope is restored. Lord Jesus, you overcame doubt. Our faith is revived. Lord Jesus, you suffered for us all. Our love is renewed. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We worship in song. Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. just sung of God's faithfulness to us. Let's turn to a short time of confession, thinking of those times when we have not been faithful to the Lord who loves us so deeply. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are always faithful to us, but we are not always faithful in the way we live for you. We are sorry for letting you down. Forgive us and renew our lives in the love and power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you promise forgiveness to all who turn back to you in faith. Thank you that you renew our lives and in Christ make us saints. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In a moment we're going to see a short video with a story of how the first church began. I've got a prize of some mini Easter eggs that I would like to give away. Listen to the video and ask yourselves this question. What did those first Christians do when they met together? There are about a half a dozen things listed in the story. Email me your list of the things you spot and the first correct answer will get a prize of some mini Easter eggs. One thing is left out of that list that is in the Bible. If you can spot that one and tell me what's missing, then you can get another prize of many Easter eggs. Now listen carefully to the story. The people who believed in Jesus and were part of the early church did everything together. They studied what the apostles taught, they ate together, prayed together, and they even invited friends to their house to talk about God. These believers felt like God was very near to them. And if that wasn't enough, these believers shared everything they had and sold their belongings to help people in need. The believers were respected by everyone else in the town. Every day, God added more people to the church because they believed in Jesus. We are living as Christians in the light of Easter. So we turn to worship in song together.
A moment of prayer as we stay in an attitude of worship. We have just sung. We choose to leave it all behind and turn our eyes towards the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. Lord Jesus, you are the ultimate prize. You are worth everything to live for. So now, as we meet in your name, make us ready to hear all you have for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier this week I met up on Zoom with Yvonne Meni and I'd like to uh, share an interview that I had with her earlier this week. Uh, she works at a London hospital in oncology, treating people who are ill with cancer. Here's the interview. Uh, Yvonne, uh, it's great to talk to you and uh, lovely to just hear a bit about uh, your work and how you're finding things now. So tell me, first of all, uh, what's your usual work like? Um, so I work as a clinical oncologist. So essentially, I am a cancer doctor. Um, I treat people with um, radiotherapy or chemotherapy for their cancers. Um, so um, I you know, take care of that side of things um, for people who've been diagnosed with um, cancer. Um, so sort of in a typical day like say today I 
um, I would normally be doing like um, a review clinic for patients who are having radiotherapy just to um, check if they are getting on with their treatment okay, if they are having any side effects and um, addressing those. Um, and then we normally have a meeting where we go through the patients who are having treatment, who are coming up for treatment. Um, we look at um, the um, plans that, um, that we have designed, um, say, last week and um, review the doses and, um, and whether we're happy with them before they then come through to treatment. Um, so that's um, typically what we would do on a, on a Tuesday and see some ward patients as well. Yeah. In this time of COVID-19, uh, things have changed and changed somewhat for you. Uh, tell us a bit about how things are different now. So I think the biggest um, couple of things that have changed, um, one of which is that we, we as a cancer service have had to really think hard about which patients we offer chemotherapy and radiotherapy to. Um, so I, in particular thinking um, that a lot of the treatments that we offer can make people who are already vulnerable even more vulnerable um, by weakening their immune system or even just you know meaning that they need to come up to hospital um, on a daily basis for treatment puts them at a higher risk of um, you know ha having infection so uh, we have to have a very uh, pragmatic but also detailed discussion um, with patients about um, the pros and cons as well as taking into account this extra um, complication that COVID's um, brought with us. Um, the other way that things has changed a lot is that we are minimizing the amount of time um, our patients spend in hospital. So we have been doing a lot more phone clinics and phone follow-ups where face-to-face -face appointments are such a bread and butter of what we do and all of a sudden that's all taken away and we are told right if you do not absolutely need to see someone they're not to come in because we don't want to put them at risk so you are you will ring them and that's what we've been doing um so that that's changed a lot yeah 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 uh just really good to hear now, particularly, what are the challenges uh, that you are personally facing, whether they are about your work or about how you are experiencing your work? Um, so I think we there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, no one really knows how long this is going on for. No one really knows. So, you know, our patients have a horrible diagnosis. They have cancer and that in itself is just so difficult. And then on top of that, now they've got the added complication of the COVID situation. Um, and it's, it's a difficult time for everyone. The decisions that we're having to make um, and to talk to them about. And a lot of times I think communication is a big factor. And we're used to, be able to being able to talk to our patients face to face to um, to get those nonverbal cues, to hold their hand if they need it, um, to offer them the empathy that, that they need at this time. And then behind a telephone, you realize how much more difficult it is and actually communicating without that ability to talk to anyone um, face to face is, is difficult. And, um, and sometimes you wish actually, even if we had video, that might help. But Unfortunately, the NHS computers aren't equipped with um, <laughs> with video capabilities, um, so it's very much trying to make do and make the best of of what we have. I think the other thing that we that I find quite challenging more personally is that there's been significant redeployment throughout the hospital. So we've lost pretty much all our junior staff to. Um, the COVID wards and as a result um, our work rotors have changed so many times in the last few weeks that every time you think you've got a new rotor it changes again and it involves us having to do nights and 
I've not done an, a resident night shift in hospital for over 10 years. So it does make me a bit nervous and it's uncharted waters for me, you know, in this environment. And, um, and so, yeah, I think though that's an added um, challenge as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just a difficult time for, for everyone, um, whether you are, you know, at, at work, um, having to, you know, go to work or, or work from home or, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the uncertainty and the, um, and the unknown. Yeah. 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 Uh, just as we, uh, just as, uh, sit here together, um, uh, let me pray for you. Thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you for Yvonne and for her uh, work amongst cancer patients. Thank you for her really caring approach and the challenges that she faces in this time. Uh, Lord, may she know uh, your spirit within her, uh, helping her to see how she can best support those patients who are in need. Uh, help her own herself uh, with her own concerns about the uncertainty of the future, the uncertainty of her own position at the moment, and whether or not she will be needed elsewhere. But above all, Lord, walk with her day by day and guide her in all she does. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we turn to today's reading from Acts chapter 2, read by Ivor Thomas. Thank you, Ivor. This morning's reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus, open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word, that we may live faithfully according to your word in the light of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. The Malvern Hills is one of my favourite places to go and walk. There are stunning views east towards the Cotswolds and west towards the Welsh Mountains. There's a path that you can see in this picture that leads to the very top it's 1,400 feet high, so it's a bit of a climb. When I was at school, we would sometimes go on to the Malvern Hills for training. My coach, my rowing coach, would take us uh, one to one part of the hills, and there we would have to run as a team from where we parked, right up the top of the Worcester Beacon at 1,400 feet, and back again. It was tough going. It was a hard slog and so easy to give up halfway. Determination and perseverance were the key. Do you know the phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going? I don't know if that's true for you today, but times are tough today. In this time of the COVID-19 lockdown, there are tough things about our lives in many ways. So I wonder, how are you doing? How are you getting on? in this time of lockdown. Some of you are going out to work and that can be tough because of the need to stay safe as you go about to your work and to your places where you meet other people. It's particularly tough if you're people who are facing those who are ill and unwell, if you're part of the NHS or working in hospital. Some of us may be feeling fairly safe. Nevertheless, I suspect we are all carrying fears and anxieties at one level or another. So there are parallels, perhaps, with Jesus' disciples. When Jesus was captured and taken away to be crucified, real fear gripped those disciples. And then Jesus was killed. 
Was it going to be their turn next? What were they going to do? Where are they going to go? So they hid out of fear and concern. But then they encountered the risen Jesus. And as Jesus appeared to those 11 disciples, their fear was transformed into joy. The joy of the risen Lord. Our reading today from Acts chapter 2 is a post-Pentecost account, but it is today in our lectionary coming between Easter and Pentecost as an inspiration to us. We are living in the light today of both the risen Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, though we look forward to celebrating that in a few weeks' time. This passage illustrates what happens when we live in the light and the truth of Jesus' resurrection. For living in that relationship with the risen Jesus is a life-transforming relationship. I wonder how many of the signs of transformation are evident in your life. Well, for one thing, you are watching today's service. You're taking part in our online service. Your faith and your own belief brings you here. Perhaps though just now, your faith is being tested, maybe severely. This passage from Acts 2 describes the beginning of the church. The faith in the risen Christ led to the first worshipping community. As people started to believe in the risen Jesus, they began to live accordingly. So in Acts 2 from verse 42 we read, They, that the early disciples, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Jesus' disciples were teachers of the faith and they shared their understanding with the growing crowd of believers who, having seen the risen Jesus, having seen the outpouring of the Spirit, also turned to faith. They longed to be followers of Jesus, freed from their sins and filmed with the Spirit too. The reading goes on, and they devote themselves to the fellowship. It became a natural desire to meet and to share together. Faith created in them a desire for community, a belonging together of believers. And we read how they experienced signs and wonders. For the power of the Holy Spirit was so evident, so manifest amongst them. And great things happened. People were healed. People were changed. There were words of prophecy. It was a time of great encouragement and building up of that early church. And that led to a change in their lives. We read of how they started to care for the needy, sharing all they had. They found in themselves a spirit of selflessness and caring for others that seemed to take over, replace their own self-centred lives with an outward-looking life of wanting to care for those who ran them in need. And we read how they ate together and in the breaking of bread. And so in that fellowship of food and sharing, they also began to remember the Last Supper. Jesus breaking the bread and sharing of the wine. A symbol and a sign of Jesus in their midst, even though now he was only present by his spirit. And then we read how they devoted themselves to prayer. They were following Jesus' example and his command, a relationship with God to whom they could pour out their hopes, their concerns, their requests. Prayer was part of their everyday life binding together that fellowship, growing that fellowship, a fellowship that was being empowered to make a difference to the world around them. How about you and me today? What parallels are there between what happened then and what is happening now? Can we, should we, expect the same? Should we look for a similar faith and behaviour in the church today? With the outpouring of the Spirit, as we celebrate Easter and Pentecost, should the same things happen? My answer would be mm, yes and mm, no. There were about half a dozen activities of faith that we can read in that reading, and they are all for today. There was Christian teaching, essential for us. There was that sharing and belonging together. Well, we're challenged to do that just at the moment, but that is part of the Christian life. 
There is that expectation that God will heal the sick and answer prayer in powerful and wonderful ways. How I long that we saw more of that than we do. But God does do the miraculous from time to time. Maybe not as much as we would wish. Then there's looking out for the poorest and those in great need. Well, that's very much of what we're trying to do at St Luke's and in our Christian lives today. Think of Friday Social or the Winter Beds Project or Feed, etc., which some of you are involved in. Fifthly, there was the eating together and the breaking of bread. Well, that's our communion service and times of social and fellowship that we have together as a church. And then sixthly, there was prayer, a foundational activity that it has to be said as a church we sometimes struggle to do outside Sundays, but prayer is surely and necessarily part, indeed a fundamental part, of our Christian life. So much of what happened then is happening today. It is and will be somewhat different. The church has moved on 2,000 years. The church has been growing and changing and being shaped in many ways into what it is today. Very different from that, uh, that early, uh, um, early uh, baby church that was so alive. Today the church is subject to many and wide-ranging and different influences, both secular and spiritual. I wish the miraculous happened more than it does, and I don't know why it should be the way it is, but there we go. We don't all sell all our possessions as they seem to then. After all, we have a welfare state to support the needy. But that doesn't stop us giving appropriately and carefully and prayerfully. We are still filled with the same Spirit of God. We still follow the Apostles' teaching and cause us to live our faith fully in today's world. So just at this moment in time, just at this point in history, in this world crisis, everything is changing. It is like God is giving us a wake-up call. It's like God is saying, what are you doing? Recognise what's important in your lives and live as you have been called in Jesus to live. So it is that a good number of us at this moment have time to spare. <clears throat> Our busy world has been made to stop in its tracks. The COVID-19 pandemic is showing us that we are not in control as we've always thought we were. We have come face to face with uncertainty. Everyone, all of us across the world, are pretty much in the same boat. I have a sense that God is putting a big question mark in front of our lives. God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to say, hey, look at me. Guys, what are you doing? This is my creation. This is my world. Stop. Recognise that I am your God. Listen to me. It's so that God is saying, hey, 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 you who? I'm still here. What are you doing? For those first Christians, Jesus' resurrection was a big, hi everyone, I'm here. And so many came to faith. We are in danger of forgetting or playing down the significance of that universe-sized event, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The risen Jesus and the Holy Spirit drew many people into faith. The church grew rapidly. The same Jesus and the same Spirit does the same work today. The result was so clear then. How clear is it in our lives today? Which takes me back to the beginning of our reading today from Acts 2. The opening phrase seems to me at the moment to be key. Do you remember the opening phrase? They devoted themselves. The disciples, the early believers, devoted themselves to learning, belonging, caring, praying, sharing, breaking of bread, communion. So there's my challenge for you, indeed for all of us. Devote yourselves once again. Renew your devotion to Jesus. 
dedicate yourself again. Make your faith first priority once again. Make Jesus number one again. Devote yourselves to Jesus living his way, to serving his world, to walking with him every day in all you do. How evident is it from the way you live that this is what you are doing? What is it looking like? I'm going to focus on one very simple step to take if you're not taking it as often as would be good. A simple step. That is this. Simply make space every day for time with Jesus. Are you doing that? If you are, like many of us, with a little more time, the pressure is not so great because you can't go to work or you're doing less or whatever it is, stop. Make space. God is calling us. He's shaking us up and saying, it's about you and me. We need to live and work together for the sake of this world. So stop. Make space, I believe God is saying, for me, for Jesus. Give him time to speak to us, that we may listen to him. And in that space, make reading the Bible a key priority in our daily lives. And in the reading of the Bible each day, creating space to have a conversation with God, which is probably more listening to God than it is speaking to God, but both are part of a conversation to take place in a space that is given just to the God who loves you and me. And then see where he takes you. He loves you, so he will continue to take you on a rich and life-giving journey. Time to give him the opportunity to lead you on. So in conclusion, I'm going to send everybody who's on the church email an email with a link to a simple online survey. It will be totally anonymous, your responses. I invite you to fill in the survey because I want to help you to think about yourself more honestly, about your faith and how you're living it every day. I will receive the feedback if you are generous enough and kind enough to send it to me. And I hope that, that uh, those results will enable me to encourage you, to help you by our teaching, by resources we offer, to live your faith every day, more fully, more faithfully. As we are, a moment of prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that by your Spirit you bring us life, that we may share in the risen life of Jesus. So now, help us to make that space for you every day. Space to connect with you, to listen to you, to talk to you, to take your word into our hearts and to live it out in our lives. We pray in our risen Saviour's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn to a moment of quiet reflection and stillness for a few moments to allow God to continue to speak to you personally.
Now we turn to our prayers. Let us pray together. Father, in this time of physical, emotional and economic turmoil in our world and our nation, we cherish this opportunity to come before you just now, to rest in your presence and to lay the burdens of our hearts before you. As many countries around the world are currently in some form of lockdown, with many to be reviewed within the next week or two weeks, we lift before you those at national decision-making level in these countries around the world, along with their advisors. We pray for wisdom, discernment and clarity of mind as they review the evidence before them and take decisions for the well-being of their nations and their people. Father, in their decision-making, guide them to consider the welfare of the most vulnerable for the weeks and months to come, as well as for the present moment. We pray too for those working for global and regional institutions who have the ability to support the countries and regions which are most at risk and at the same time are least equipped to deal with the virus. We think particularly of those regions already ravaged by conflict, food scarcity and deep-rooted economic poverty. Father, in these times when members of global institutions may be tempted to act and think only for the good of themselves or their own nations, Please ch challenge and equip them to pursue equity and justice in the sharing of highly sought after yet limited resources. For our own nation, Lord, as for others, we pray for an end to the suffering and to the pain which this virus is causing. We bring before you today the thousands of families who are grieving the loss of their loved ones, many whom are mourning alone without being able to offer or receive even the comfort of a hug. Father, in a way which surpasses our understanding, be their comfort and their sufficiency. For ourselves, Lord, we ask that you would steer us too to make loving and wise decisions in these days, to look out for our neighbours, to be mindful of those who might be struggling, and to encourage and support the efforts of all the key workers who are putting themselves on the line for us each day, we thank you that amidst the sorrow and the struggle, we see examples of selfless love, of community spirit and of hope. Help us, Father, as we go about our daily lives this week, to constantly seek that hope and joy which you bring and to share this whenever we can with those around us. Help us to be your church. We pray all this in and through your name. Amen. So we come to communion together. Make sure you have with you some bread and a glass of wine. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit 
that this bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Now as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And now in faith receive the bread and wine as the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We take a few moments to take bread and wine. And now to the after communion prayer together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now as we prepare for the week ahead of us, may our closing worship be our inspiration for living daily for Jesus our Lord and Saviour.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those you love, today and always. Amen. Do please join us online immediately after the service for a chat over virtual coffee. Meanwhile, God bless and stay safe. Zaria is an awesome God he from heaven above.